Everybody will. It's not a question of will you or if. Or, no, everybody will. The Bible says so. The question really is, will we confess his name now while we live to our, to our salvation and the, and the glorious prospect of spending eternity in heaven with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and all the saints gone before us? Or will we confess that name at judgment to our eternal damnation? Because you see, you may know some people who say, well, that's a hard case. He's, he's, every knee will bow. No exceptions. And my prayer for you, everyone within the sound of my voice, is either that you have or you soon will. While you still breathe this earth's atmosphere, confess the name of Jesus. Well, if you've been tracking with us, we've been going through the five solas of the Reformation. Uh, Tuesday, October 31st, is the 500th anniversary of when Martin Luther nailed his 95 complaints called the 95 Theses to the door, it was like a bulletin board, to the door of the church at Wittenberg, Germany. I've seen, been kind of jealous recently, it seems for several of my friends have been over in uh, Wittenberg, they're standing at that door and I'm, I'm guarding my heart, trying not to be discontent about that, just rejoicing for them that they can be there and taking in their pictures they're sending. And set a flame for the gospel. Spurgeon said the gospel was sweetly singing in the dungeon of darkness of the medieval church. And the prison doors opened to the sound of the hammering of 95 theses to the door at the church at Wittenberg. And the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century was spawned. So we've been looking at the, at the five solas. Sola Scriptura, uh, the Bible alone is our authority. Remember, not solo. It's not like we don't read anything else in the Bible. The Bible is my creed, and then I can make it say what I want to say. No, we, we understand that the Bible alone is our authority, and that, that the church has been speaking for a couple of millennia now about the truth of Scripture, and we need to find ourselves lining up with that. Sola gratia. Grace alone, see if the Bible is our only authority and we read it to find out what does God have to say about salvation. We know that the salvation he offers sinners is by grace alone, sola gratia. We looked last week at through faith alone, sola fide. Today, solus Christus in Christ alone. Next Sunday morning, Lord willing, in fact, we'll watch the video tonight. I hope you'll be with us. Soli Deo Gloria, to the glory of God alone. Five truths that not only shaped the Christian life in the 16th century, but that shape, should shape the Christian life today. Joshua referenced a survey. I read that. It made me weep. So-called evangelical Christians in this country too many would be in no danger of drowning if they fell face forward into their understanding of biblical truth concerning God, Jesus, sin, salvation, even truth. So there's a reason we've taken six weeks out of our schedule, Sunday morning and Sunday night, to think together about these things. My heart's desire is that none of you would fall victim. I read, I read Facebook and I read where some young people that are now adults, some you would know, some you wouldn't know, some used to attend here, some grew up in our youth camps, embrace the most awful things. It's shocking. My prayer is that we're gonna be found faithful to the generation following. That the Spirit of God will apply the truth of God and our children will not be ignorant about such things. Well, Solus Christus and Christ alone, John chapter 14. We read the larger passage, verses uh, 1 to 14. I want you to stand with me. I'm going to read verses 5 to 7. We're going to hone in on verse 6 and then some companion passages today as we think about Jesus Christ as the only way, the only one in whom and whereby 
sinners may move from being under the wrath and condemnation of God and move into the blessed relationship as sons and daughters of the living God. Follow along as I read these verses. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. He's speaking prophetically there that when they, when they uh, at Pentecost, not many days hence, are convinced by the Spirit that the one who was crucified and rose from the grave, their, their rabbi was the promised Messiah. They would then, by knowing Jesus, listen to me now, the only way you can know God meaningfully is to know him through his son, Jesus Christ. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, one writer said recently, these are not good days for the evangelical church. And anyone who steps back from what's going on for a moment to try to evaluate our life and times will understand that. This was written in 1995. In the last few years, a number of important books have been published, all trying to understand what's happening. And they're saying much the same thing, even though the authors come from very different backgrounds, doing different work. You may have read David Wells' uh, No Place for Truth when it came out years ago. Maybe Michael, Michael Horton, if you're familiar with him, uh, wrote uh, Power Religion. Maybe John MacArthur's book, Ashamed of the Gospel. But what's interesting, this, this author pointed out well, the subtitles to each of these books. Wells' book, No Place for Truth, is subtitled, Whatever Happened to Evangelical Theology? Horton's book is subtitled, The Selling Out of the Evangelical Church. John MacArthur's book subtitled, When the Church Becomes Like the World. How does that happen? When you forget your heritage, when you forget your roots, when, you know, the, the old saying that people who don't know their history's mistakes are doomed to repeat them. Another way of saying is what the, what the fathers, what the parents did in moderation, the children will do in excess. The Bible says it this way, the, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. There's the current church in the 90s and in 2017. Seriously confused. One of the things in the survey said that, that the majority of evangelicals believe that Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation. And then they went on to say, but, but God will let people into heaven by other ways, other, other religions. There's a schizophrenia in the church today. John Armstrong, who's a, who's a friend, wrote a book back in this same period, uh, The Coming Evangelical Crisis. When he was interviewed about it, he said, I don't think it's coming, I think it's here. And so we weigh in to this uh, confused milieu of religious thinking, thinking about being a Christian, with this assertion, solus Christus, Christ alone. It's one of the five solas. We've given you kind of a brief definition of each one week to week. It emphasizes that the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is not only necessary for salvation, but sufficient to save to the uttermost that no amount of human works or merit can contribute to Christ's finished priestly work. His all-sufficiency means that we are insufficient of ourselves, and He is the only way whereby we may be made right with God. There is no other way. The Baptist Confession of Faith that, that we uh, set before you here says that this office of mediator between God and man is proper only to Christ, who is the prophet, priest, and king of the church of God, and may not be either in whole or any part thereof transferred from him to any other. Christ alone in the 1500s laid siege upon the authority and infallibility of the Pope. 
and those his emissaries sent out to the villages. Martin Luther understood when he said, I must listen to the gospel. It tells me not what I must do, but what Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has done for me. We talked last week in Sola Fide about an alien righteousness, a righteousness outside of ourselves. That righteousness is fixed in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. The heart of the gospel is not about us. The heart of the gospel is Christ for us. Romans 8. If God is for us, who can be against us? And if he's not for us, it doesn't matter who is for us. The essence of Paul's message that Christ came for us to die for us, to do for us what we could not and would not do for ourselves. He obeyed, Christ did. He was crucified. He was raised. He is ascended. He is returning. The church that Martin Luther challenged was teaching that the gospel was about what Christ was doing in us. By grace, we told you when we looked at Sola Gratia that there was, they used uh, the vocabulary but not the dictionary to assign the same meanings to things like grace. That the gospel taught in Luther's day was about what we must do to, to do our own part in order to benefit. We must cooperate with grace. Well, you say, that's, well, that's, that's, what, that's what many in evangelicalism teach today. God's done all he can do, the rest is up to you. Good news is that we have no part not in the story of the gospel. We're the recipient, we're the beggars, we're not contributors to the story. Listen to John Calvin. Christ stepped in, took the punishment upon himself and bore the judgment due to sinners. With his own blood he expiated the sins which made them enemies of God and thereby satisfied him, that is God. We look to Christ alone for divine favor and fatherly love. Therefore, Christ is called King of Peace. And our peace, because he quiets all agitations of conscience. If we ask the means, we must come to the sacrifice by which God has been appeased. For anyone unconvinced that God is appeased by that one atonement in which Christ endured his wrath will never cease to tremble. In short, we must seek peace for ourselves only in the anguish of Christ, our Redeemer. I want us to see in this passage this morning and, and look for a few minutes at some companion passages, two things that he says in, in verse 6, Jesus does. Jesus' amazing assertion. And the second, Jesus' exceptional exclusivity. Look at this amazing assertion. We, again, our text talks about in verse 6, I am the way the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This, this amazing assertion that Jesus makes, he says to Thomas, I am the way and the truth and the life. He declares the language there is, I'm the only way. I'm not a way. I'm not one of many. I've told you before that people in our culture, although it's, it's growing more and more hostile toward Jesus, people in our culture like to like think they can mollify the matter by saying, well, you know, I don't think Jesus is the Son of God, but I think he was a good man. Here's this good man saying he's the only way. If he's not telling the truth, he's a liar. He's not a good man. It's like one fellow wrote years ago, he's either Lord, liar, or lunatic. He's a liar if he claims to be the Son of God, the only way we're thinking about today, and he's not. He's a lunatic if he thinks he's the Son of God and he's not. But he is the Son of God. He is Lord. And he makes this, this amazing assertion. I am the way. We don't know the way to God, Thomas says. I am the way. I am the truth. All religious truth must be measured in the light of Jesus. If it contradicts Jesus, then it's not true. No matter how sincerely people believe it. When one religion says, ah, Jesus didn't die on a cross, that is a devil's lie and should not be allowed. He did die on the cross. He predicted he was going to die on the cross. 
When some people say, well, you know, we don't, we don't need a bodily resurrection. He did rise from the grave. We do need a bodily resurrection because there was a bodily resurrection. We just need somebody to show us what love looks like. No, we need somebody to atone for our sins. That's what Jesus did. He is, he is the way, the truth, the life. He said in John 10, 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I come that they might have life and have life abundantly. Now, that's not the Western definition of abundantly where we got, we got more than the Joneses. It's, it's the biblical understanding, a life full of God, a life full of hope. So the gospel, if anything, is a message of hope. And I don't, have you noticed? Have you noticed that people, if, if, you've, if you've watched these things for decades, as I have, people used to hope in a lot of stuff, and all that stuff's coming apart. And here we wade into the matter saying, let me tell you the reason that I have hope. A little tract I wrote that we'll be giving out to children with the, with the full-size bars of Hershey's milk chocolate uh, Tuesday. Yeah, because our, God's, our God does things full size. He doesn't do things bite size. The tract basically says, well, you, you love sweets. We all love sweets. Everybody, that's why, look, children are not going out Tuesday night to dance with the devil, all right? They're going out because like they, they like candy. My little two-year-old said to me this morning, he said, Grandpa, Grandpa. I think the five-year-old said, Two days, Halloween. And the two-year-old said, we get candy. The track says that God has done something very sweet for us. The most precious sweetness shown to us is in giving Jesus Christ to die for sinners who don't deserve it. Christ alone. He is, he is the way, the truth, the life. That's his assertion. That's his declaration. It's interesting, he did not say to Simon, well, Simon, let me tell you, if you repent and believe the gospel, then you can go. No, he, what? he was talking about, I am the way. Look to me. Know me. Trust me. Love me. Follow me. It is all about me. We're studying on Sunday nights. We're going to get back to this in a couple of weeks. We've been looking on Sunday nights at searching the scriptures, seeing Jesus Christ in all of scripture. We're going Bible book by Bible book on Sunday nights. We're getting ready to go into Jeremiah pretty soon. And Jesus said to the Pharisees, you, you search the scriptures, you think that in them you find life, but they, they testify about me. They're about me. He said, when the Holy Spirit comes, he won't glorify himself, he will glorify me. Now folks, that sounds like an ego trip unless Jesus is the Son of God, the only way of salvation. Then I'm delighted to hear him talk about himself all he wants to because he is my only hope. So that's what he said, that was his Amazing assertion, but I want you to see here this exceptional exclusivity as, as if so that he will not be misunderstood. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Then he says the negative. No one comes to the Father except through me. This notion that it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere is a devilish lie that's going to land multitudes in hell. This idea that we're all trying to get to the same place, well, we may, we may have some sort of secret desire to be in heaven when we die, but the very language, all trying to get to the same place. Religion, religion is about telling man how he can get to God. Christianity, biblical Christianity, is about telling sinners how God came to them in Jesus Christ. No one, no exceptions, no one can come. Someone says, well, I, I want to go to heaven, but I don't want anything to do with Jesus. Bad news. First of all, you will have something to do with Jesus. Remember, every knee will bow. <laughs> every tongue will confess. Philippians 2 that he is Lord, Jesus Christ is Lord. And it'll be done, we're looking next Sunday morning, Solideo Gloria, 
It'll be done to the glory of God. Whether God is glorified, follow me now, the scriptures teach in the, in the end of the Bible that God is glorified in the salvation of sinners and he is glorified in the damnation of rebels who live this life scornful toward him, despising his son, rejecting his overtures. He is glorified either way. The angels will cry hallelujah when the saints are taken into heaven at last and they will cry hallelujah when the rebels are damned eternally. Now, if you don't understand why that is, come back next Sunday. We're going to look at the glory of God because he's, he's worthy of that. And Jesus says, no one. But what about, what about the people that live in the darkest recesses of the earth? And if you read missiologists, they've been telling us this for years. Inevitably, somebody who's on mission somewhere in these dark regions bumps into somebody who says, Tell me about him. Tell me about who? Tell me about this, this one. Muslims by the multitudes, people, are finding believers in the Middle East and North Africa and saying, tell me about him. Who? And I, I, Isi al Nisa, I think is how they, how they say Jesus. No excuse. Romans says no excuse. The whole world will be held speechless before God. And he's all for Jesus. You see, we would like to find excuses and reasons. What we ought to do is, is, is burn our lives out like the Apostle Paul did to introduce Jesus to people who otherwise will never know him. He's the only way. And there is no other way. Solus Christus. The, the reformers were making a statement in their day. They were challenging, listen to me, challenging the Pope of Luther's day would be like challenging Kim Jong-un in North Korea. Because see, he, he thinks he's divine too. He thinks he's a god in North Korea. That's where that's all, they all must worship him. And the reformers weighed into this and said, no. Christ alone. Now, the wonderful news is that for many of you, not everybody here, but for many of you, you have heard about him since you were small. Now, you may have heard from imperfect people. You may have heard from hypocrites. I've told you about my background. My mother was most godly woman I've ever known in my life, and my dad was the opposite. And I heard him pray in church, and I, he was my Sunday school teacher in our youth department. But you know something? He may not have been living the gospel. He was speaking the truth of the gospel in Sunday school. Yeah, we heard from some imperfect types. In fact, you've been 12 and a half years, you've been hearing from an imperfect type about this, me. But the message is what's glorious. Don't get caught up in the messenger. Consider the truth of the message, that Jesus Christ is the only way. Listen just real quickly here. Listen to Peter, Acts 4.12. He's preaching. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Exclusivity. Now, this, is not a, this is not a fun day in America to be exclusive. You know, that's the whole thing is being inclusive, inclusive, inclusive. And if you're not inclusive, guess what? You're excluded. So the, the, the hypocrisy even of the left is, is kind of makes you want to laugh. But we're exclusive on this. Think about Paul, 1 Timothy 2.5. Paul said, there is one God, well, that shatters all the polytheists. There is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men. He's talking about the ascended, interceding Jesus, the man, Christ Jesus. Remember Jesus in the, uh, on the Emmaus Road after he had risen, Acts 24, 27. 
There were these two disciples who were grieving because the one they had hoped would be the Messiah had been crucified. And they'd heard something about him being raised from the dead, but they were still grieving over his death. So Jesus encounters them on the road to Emmaus. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. I would love to have heard that sermon. I would love to have heard Jesus open up the Old Testament. I said, remember when the, in the Old Testament when it said that? Yeah, I was talking about the Messiah. Remember when it said, yeah, well, that's talking about the Messiah. Remember when it said, yeah, well, that's, I'd love to have heard that sermon. And of course, I mentioned John 5, 39, where Jesus told them, the scriptures bear witness of me. Remember Philip, one of the early disciples, said to Nathaniel in John 1, 45, we found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. This, this declaration. And Luther had to come to this himself. Jesus Luther called Jesus the center and circumference of the Bible. The center and circumference of the Bible. Get that? He is what it's all about and who he is is wrapped all around it. So if you miss Jesus, you think little of Jesus, you think lightly of Jesus, you think you can have God without Jesus, you're mistaken. And I know, I know here you say, well, you're preaching to the choir, preacher. We're, we're sitting here in a Baptist church because we do believe something about Jesus. I understand that. But you encounter people. Some of you will bump into people today when you leave here. But that is not a given. Joshua mentioned earlier, this, the idea that Jesus Christ is the only way to God is not a given in this culture anymore. In fact, increasingly, he is seen, Jesus is, as a bigot and a racist and a misogynist. That's the fancy words people like to throw around. And therefore, his followers must be that too. And yet we must wade into this culture and say, you know, I really, your, your sincerity really moves me, but you're sincerely wrong. And this one, you know, you can be wrong about the mechanic you take your car to, be wrong about some investments. You, you can be wrong about a lot of things, but if you're wrong about this one, this one's fatal, eternally fatal. Sing to your children at home. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus. Make much of Jesus. Be sure that children understand. That means that we've got to understand it first and embrace it. That God sent Jesus, his only son, as the only way to be made right with him. And to miss Jesus and to think that you can square up with God will be fatal. Hear what God said when Peter was chattering on the Mount of Transfiguration. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Hear him. So I'll, leave, I'll close with this this morning. Have you heard Jesus? Paul says in Romans 10, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And he starts asking these questions. How then shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? I'll, Clearly, only believers will call on Jesus. Only those who've had that transformation in their lives called the new birth. And out of that comes this trust and confidence in Jesus. How shall they be saved? Except they believe. And how shall they believe in him? And if you read your translations, except for the New American Standard, they're going to say, of whom they have not heard. Well, there certainly is a hearing of him. We've got to take the message. But that's not what it's talking about. How shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? I remember. I listened to preachers for years. My mother dragged me to church every Sunday whether I wanted or not, sat me down next to her. If I messed up, she slapped me upside the head. She, I was going to be there. But one day, one day, it was as if the room parted. And there I was, 
And I didn't hear the audible voice, but it was just as if the Lord said, He's talking to you. You. Have you heard Jesus? Have you heard him? Hashem? They believe in him whom they have not heard. That's Jesus through the scriptures. With a, with a faithful preacher, a faithful Sunday school teacher, a faithful mom or dad, a faithful friend, maybe a stranger at your door speaking the truth of the gospel to you that Jesus Christ is the way. The truth. Have you heard him? Has, has he said to you, I'm talking to you? That's when you're saved. That's why Solus Christus is so critical. Because we get to messing around with thinking there's other ways, other ideas. You miss him. And you miss him. You miss God. And you miss God, you miss heaven. only Jesus. I pray that you love him. I pray that you adore him. I pray that you worship him. I pray that when you read the scriptures, you see it's all about him. And I pray that you serve him. And I pray that you share him. And I pray that when we come to the end of our days and stand before God in judgment with the Son standing next to him, that we will hear, well done, good and faithful servant. This is the Bill Askell paraphrase of it. You made much of me. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for the gospel which teaches us that Jesus Christ lived and died and rose again. According to the scriptures, and that we can pray. Cry out in repentance and faith and be saved. Acknowledge Him while we live and with the promise that He will acknowledge us before the Father in heaven and yet know that He said as surely if we deny Him while we live, He will deny us before the Father. And we know that if you listen to anyone, you listen to Him. Oh, God, in a day, false gospels, confused messages, pluralism, help us to be clear that Christ alone saves. By your grace alone, through faith in Jesus Christ alone, we are saved according to what your scripture teaches us. Save those here today, Lord, who are not yet followers of Christ. They know about him, but they don't know him. They've heard of him, but they've never heard him. Save them, we pray, for Jesus' sake.